May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With all your heart. There's a young man, he's not so young anymore, who is a well-known sports figure around here. He's known as the Iron Man, Cal Ripken Jr. He played baseball for the Baltimore Orioles, and he played in over 2,000 consecutive games. That's why they called him the Iron Man. He never sat out. It took dedication and commitment to get to that point. Many times when we think of sports characters, some names that come to our minds right now for many of us are G3, whom we consider, some of us consider, quite an athlete. I was talking to my son-in-law, Brian Wright, who works for the Orlando Magic, and he was saying that uh, RG3, who was still recuperating, he's such a competitor that they had kind of a little competition of all the football players. And even though he was not fully healthy, he beat all of them in sit-ups and push-ups because he is such a devoted person to excellence. I'm talking about with all your heart. Eric Lydell. Some of you all may know who he is from years ago. He actually ran in the Olympics, but he was so committed to Jesus Christ and his Lord that even though he went to the Olympics to run the 100-yard dash, it was going to be on his Sabbath, and so he was not going to run. And so he had to, to run in another race. But he was so committed to his relationship to God, that even fame was not as important to him. It says that even when he won several medals and he came home to England, to Scotland, he was such a hero. But you know what he did? He went to China and worked as a missionary and spent pretty much the rest of his life there, not resting on his accolades of physical feats with all your heart. God does not call everything that we do to be easy. I teach at Tacoma Academy, and I tell my students all the time, Tacoma Academy is one of the hardest places to be a Christian. Hello, Jeremy. The reason I say that is because we as Christians shouldn't be, but we are quite hard on each other. And when you claim the name of Christ, we are sometimes the quickest to point out someone else's fault. It's hard to be a Christian sometimes in a Christian church. God does not call for it to be easy, but he does say that he will take care of us. If you'd open your Bibles to Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, I'm sure all of you all are familiar with Jeremiah 29, a very well-known text. But as we look at Jeremiah 29, we understand that Israel was in captivity. They were in a foreign land. And if you read very carefully, it actually says that God led them into captivity. And he called on them, and it says in verse 13, verse 12, then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Verse 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you. God talking. 
plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You will seek me, verse 13, and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. To be good at something, to excel at something, you have to commit yourself to what you want to excel in. I used to exercise quite a lot. It's not quite that evident anymore. But I used to exercise at least five days a week doing aerobics and lifting weights for years. I was dedicated to it. I look at some people, and I remember going to Chicago to a food festival, and a Mr. Olympus, Mr. Olympia, walked by. And he was only about this short. But he was so big. And I know that it takes a tremendous amount of commitment to get to that point. It doesn't happen overnight. Just like doing well in school, Jeremy, just like doing well in school, it takes dedication. You have to commit yourself to doing your best. It may not always be easy. I can remember when I was at Middle East College, my father was a missionary over in Africa, and the closest school that was on the American system was in Beirut, Lebanon. And the family lived in Nairobi, Kenya, but that was the closest school. And I wasn't about to join um, the school that was in Nairobi because it was on the British system. Now, we know that there's a big difference. I was going to be a junior in high school, and if I had gone to the British school, the British system, I'd probably still be in high school now. And so I, not by choice, but my father sent myself and my two older sisters to Beirut. Graduated from high school, went to my first year of college. It was wonderful. But I wasn't dedicated. I wasn't committed to doing my best. So that when I started college, after the first quarter, I had a 1.9 GPA. That's horrible. But to show you if you put your mind to something, you can turn it around. I decided, thinking that my father was going to really spank me, even though I was in college, that he was going to spank me when, I, when he got that report card, never said a thing. But I dedicated myself, not for my father, but I knew I could do better than that. And when I put my mind to it, even though I received my first and only F in my entire life in my first quarter of college, from that point on, after my second year, because I had to really acclimate myself, I never got anything less than an A. Because I committed myself, I had to work hard to pull things up. God calls us to seek him with all our heart, not just a portion of it. And if you read, it doesn't mean that things will always be easy. Mark 8, verse 35 says, whoever will lose his life for my sake, which means there are times when as Christians we are beaten down. Yea, killed, maybe not physically, and maybe we are called to die for the Lord. But we are put in situations that are not always easy. I remember a couple who were so dedicated to the Lord and tremendous in terms of their health. Vegans never put anything in their body that was unhealthy. And yet, they came down with cancer. 
God does not always say things will be easy, but he will get you through it. God will free us from the captivity of our own plans. If you notice in Jeremiah 13, they were in captivity. I will be found by you, declares the Lord in verse 14 of Jeremiah 29, and will bring you back from captivity. Now, I want you to think. This is not really a sermon. I want you to think. What are you being held captive by? Because all of us are in some form of captivity. Are your possessions? Is that what's holding you in captivity? This week something happened to, to me that's never happened in my life, and I hope will never happen again. On Thursday, my wife called me as she got home, and she said, Honey, did you come home any time during the day? And I said, No. Why? The house is wide open. I said, Call the police. And so by the time I got home, somebody had been in our house and robbed us. All I could think of was that how blessed I was that my wife or myself was not in the house. I could have cared less about my possessions. The safety of my family and my dog was more important than the things that anybody could take. And so when the police walk through and What's missing? What's missing? With all that, that they had gone through our house, opened our drawers, thrown things out, they only took a laptop, some change. I had two $20 bills sitting on the kitchen counter. That's it. And as I was talking to the detective, the detective said, well, there have been some kids around High Point that have skipped school and have been going through the neighborhoods doing some things. And just a few weeks ago, we caught three of them, 15-year-olds. And what they did in that home was they went into the refrigerator, took out all the condiments, ketchup, mustard, and just sprayed it all over the house. Caused over 20 thousand dollars worth of damage. And the detective asked the young man, why did you do it? I don't know. Are you held captive by your possessions? Possessions are just things. And yet sometimes people hold that more important. They spend more time with their possessions than they do in their relationship to Jesus Christ. Are you held captive by your possessions? Are you held captive by your desires? We live in a world that is so... We're in Satan's world. Satan is the king of this world. And Christ is coming to take it back. But right now, Satan's in control. Look at the media. Look at everything that goes against Scripture and is considered the norm. That's Satan's world. And so even though we as Christians should not be bound in captivity by the desires of the world. Many of us are. Some of our young people know more about some of the people in the world than they knew about Bible characters. Some of the stars, the reality shows, they know more about that than they know Bible stories. The desires, are we held captive by our desires? Are you held captive by
by your past sins. I want you to listen to me. Because Satan himself will bring up your past and you don't believe that you are forgiven. And if you focused on your past and the sin of your past, your eyes are off Jesus. And Satan loves that. Do you realize that sometimes Satan encourages us to go to church? Because in church sometimes, people talk about each other. Sometimes people don't want somebody to sit next to them because that's my pew. And the attitude that sometimes we have in church, Satan says, yes, go. Because our eyes will be taken off of Jesus and put on those around us. If you've asked God to forgive you for your sins, then by faith, you need to believe that you are forgiven. Because it says in 1 John 1, 9, come on, you all are Bible scholars, if we confess, come on, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a fact. And when we start relying on our feelings, Satan bringing up things in the past, Satan may be bringing up things that you did today that you know you should not have. And you're not holding on to that precious promise. When you've asked for forgiveness, Satan loves it. You are held captive even by your sin. You're held captive by your appetite. Yep. Your appetite. Do you realize that appetite can be the root of so many other sins? It's not just about food. I remember going to the eye doctor. I don't have 20-20 vision. I have little pieces of plastic in my eye, contacts. And as I went to my eye doctor and he looked at my eyes, he says, you know, I can tell you if you're sick just by looking at your eyes. I said, no, you can't. Yes, I can. You have a little diabetes, don't you? I said, I didn't tell you that. I can see it in your eye. That's why they say the eyes are the windows of the soul. They can see all kinds of diseases just by looking at your eyes. Appetite. Are you controlled by food, things you want, appetite? Are you held captive by that? And one other thing I just want to mention. Are you held captive by presumption? Presumption is presuming on God's love, God's protection. There's something that we used to talk about, and I hope that we don't talk about it too much anymore in our church, but sometimes it becomes a part, something called cheap grace. Cheap grace is the belief and the teaching that if I do my best, God's going to make up the rest because he is so forgiving, so kind, so loving, that I can pretty much do what I want to do, and God loves me so much that he will always forgive me. And we play on the grace of God without realizing that God calls upon us to follow what he says instead of, well, you're such a loving God, you'll always forgive me. Cheap grace. Do you realize that grace is not cheap? Because Jesus Christ himself died on the cross for you and me. He gave all for you and me. It's not cheap. But sometimes we make it cheap. One of the things, one of the hard things that 
I have to talk about my school. That's, I'm there, I've been there since 1986. One of the things that I know our young people struggle with, that I struggle with our young people, is taking the Lord's name in vain. Not out and out cursing God's name, but taking his name in vain. How many times have you heard you know, just going through the halls or anywhere you go, oh, Jesus. Not in the context of Jesus, but just a phrase that comes out of their mouths. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. We presume upon God's love and mercy. He understands. It's okay. I can use his name anytime I want. Do you realize the angels, the angels, the covering cherubs bow before him and cover themselves and just say, holy? Do you realize when you're in the presence of God, God, there are things you shouldn't do, things you shouldn't say? I use this illustration a lot in terms of my, my father was pretty tough. I loved him, but he was tough. I tell the story, and this is a true story. One Sabbath in Atlanta, my dad was pastoring the Berean Seventh-day Adventist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was a pretty big church. Balcony, I don't know how many sections on the floor, and a chapel. And I remember one Sabbath he was preaching and just sharing God's word, and all of a sudden, in the middle of his sermon, he stopped. And he pointed up to the balcony. And he asked for two deacons to go up into the balcony and bring him two young men and bring them down to the front. Everybody in the church was silent because he stopped. And he waited. And the deacons went up in the balcony. And of course, you know, when when somebody's pointing somewhere, everybody's turning to look to see what happened. They brought these two young men down, sat them in the front, and he went right ahead, continued to preach. At the end of the service, after he had greeted everybody, you know, the young men had not moved. And he came back in, and he sat down and talked to them. And he said, do you realize that in church you're in the presence of God? And there are things that you should not do in the presence of God. And they were playing. They weren't being, well, they were being teenagers. They were my friends. And I would normally have been sitting with them. But praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That Sabbath, I sat with my mother. I was so incredibly happy because I would have been right in the midst of what they were doing. They were just playing. He was trying to instill within them their things in the presence of God that you do not do because he's holy. He's the God of the universe. You don't just act any way. When you seek me with all God says that he will bring us out of captivity. Do you realize that sometimes God leads us into captivity to save us? When you read in Jeremiah 29, just a little bit further, it says that I, God speaking, brought you into slavery. I allowed you to be brought into slavery so that I could save you. Sometimes God allows things to happen to us to bring us back to him. How sad it is that many times the only time that we look to God is when we're in tremendous despair. But many times God allows things to happen so we realize it's not about us. He's taking care of us 
and we need to look to him. John 14, verse 23 says that if we keep his commands, he will live in us. He will make his home in us. When you surrender to God, you have to surrender completely. Cal Ripken devoted himself to being the best that he could be. It took a lot of work. RG3 takes a lot of work, takes a lot of time to be the best that he can be. Eric Lydell, the best that he could be in his commitment to his Lord. The question is, are you exercising yourself to be the best with God? In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul used exercise as a way to explain his commitment to God. When you look in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27, it talks about him beating his body so he could bring it under submission. He had to be dedicated, so committed, that he wouldn't allow just anything to happen. But it takes hard work. I was watching Diana Nyad. You all know who that is, right? No, you don't. Shame on you. Just this week, she swam from Cuba to the Florida Keys. She swam, let me say it again. She swam from Cuba to the Florida Keys. Took her over 50 hours of continuous swimming. And she's older than me. And I'm old. In her 60s. Do you think that she could do that overnight? She had to practice to do that. She has tried before. Last time she tried, she almost made it, but didn't quite make it. Jellyfish stings. Sharks in the water. Really? But she was so committed that she made it. Paul beat his body into submission. It takes hard work. What I'm trying to say, as I end, is that the scripture says, if you seek me with all your heart, not just a portion, with all your heart, then I, God, will bring you out of captivity and I will give you so many wonderful things because I want the best for you. To be committed to God, we have to make him more important than anything or anyone else. Whether it be possessions, whether it be our desires, whether it be our past sin, whether it be our appetite, whether it be presumption, we have to commit ourselves totally to God so that we're not in captivity, kept in captivity. Seek me. It's not always safe. But you have to give all. To be an iron man for Jesus takes total surrender. We must seek God with all our hearts. The question that I ask you, are you willing to commit yourself totally to him? What do you spend your time doing? What is most important to you? When you examine your life, that shows what you are committed to. 
I'll end with this. It's kind of a sad story. Because this married couple, and I'm sure you've heard this, I'm sure some preacher has shared this before. Because preachers have a tendency to share things. We get these stories. This couple goes to a marriage counselor, been married for years. The husband didn't want to go because he thought everything was fine. But the wife, we need to talk. And so the wife shared, he never, he never tells me he loves me. But I show you. But you never say it. And of course he says, I told you one time. And I haven't changed my mind. Do we tell God we love him once? Is that it? I know that if I, only told, if I never told my wife I loved her, even if I took care of her, she would doubt my love. We need to be willing to tell people that we love Jesus Christ. We need to show it by our actions, but we need to be willing that when somebody comes up to you, why are you so happy? Didn't you just get robbed? Yeah. Aren't you upset? No. Why? Oh, let me, let me, let me talk to you for a minute. It's because of Jesus Christ that I can be at peace when Jesus Christ is in my life. We have to be willing to say it, not just in word, but of course in action. The question is, are you willing to commit yourself totally to him with all your heart. Trust me, with the Holy Spirit guiding us, with us surrendering our wills to God, we will be totally committed to him. And everything that we need, everything that we desire, God will provide it for us. He promises that. If you ask, I will give. Just seek me with all your heart because I love you. Are you committed to him?